Well, let's now go to our guests uh, in London. Alex MacDonald is a journalist who contributed to the Middle East Eye Report. Alex has also filed his own stories on this topic. We're also joined by the retired British Army officer and security analyst, Charles Shoebridge. Alex, Charles, thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, Charles, the question has to go to you about the credibility of the report as far as you see it. Do you believe it? Yes, I do believe it. Um, first of all, I know the British Army very well. Um, I was in the British Army, a member of the British Army for eight years. Um, this isn't to say that I saw uh, wanton law-breaking, but uh, soldiers will be soldiers, and it means that a small proportion of those, possibly a small proportion of those, will take advantage of any relaxation of the rules that govern their conduct, even in combat zones. And I think that's covered very clearly by the, um, by the Middle East Army report. Also, of course, uh, the journalists that contributed to this report, of course, your other guests, but also... Ian Cobain are, are highly credible, I believe, in my experience of following them over a number of years, certainly Ian Cobain. And um, it strikes me that this is a well-balanced report. It gives both sides of the story. And I think that the account is credible, not least, of course, because it relies upon, in some cases, named witnesses, in other cases, witnesses who understand we wouldn't want to give their names, but actually who are soldiers themselves. And I suspect uh, if court proceedings were ever to result from this, which I think we're going to come on to later on, possibly, um, they, of course, could be required to give evidence in this case. So, no, it doesn't surprise me um, at all. And, um, uh, but what does surprise me, of course, is that uh, with the exception of yourselves and a couple of other people, um, this has attracted uh, relatively little um, coverage in the British media. That's to say, since this Middle East report, uh, I report, um, arose, <clears throat> there's been almost no coverage of it. And, of course, you would expect, uh, of course, cynics wouldn't expect, but others might expect that certainly the liberal media might have covered this in more detail. Yeah, we'll certainly come on also to the fact that uh, this particular government that's in power in the UK at the moment has spoken out against human rights lawyers who have been trying to bring some of these cases uh, to people's attention, as well as the media doing that. Uh, Alex, there are no named sources <coughs> in either piece written by you or by Ian, who wrote the original piece, and some of the stories are not independently verified. Are you able to tell us anything about any of the regiments that may have been involved, about the soldiers uh, and whether they are former soldiers, whether they are current soldiers. Why were they concerned if they were former soldiers about keeping their names anonymous? Well, I mean, I, I really wouldn't want to go into um, the background details of the people that um, Ian uh, interviewed. I mean, the, the first, just to, just to clarify, the first uh, article was, was Ian's work. I mean, um, I wouldn't like to go into the details about them because a very good reason they've kept the names anonymous for for any number of reasons um uh, in terms i mean in terms of my follow-up report of course i did actually speak to iraqis who were willing to say that this sort of thing was going on at least in terms of the idea of the british army uh, targeting civilians uh obviously they can't give much insight into what kind of orders have been given and what kind of rules of engagement there were but in terms of the actual kind of you know impact of it they they have plenty of stories to tell and happy to go on the record about it yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, let's talk about that impact, because not only is it, of course, we're talking about people actually losing their lives, it's also about the impact of the British Army's role in Iraq and its occupation of Basra in particular that is affected by all of this. So, Alex, tell us about the people, the Iraqis you spoke to in the follow-up report and what they were telling you about their time uh, in terms of the reference, uh, the time frame that we're talking about here, what was happening. Well, I mean, the Iraqis I spoke to, and I've been to Iraq um, uh, quite recently a few times, including Basra. I mean, Iraqis I've spoken to, they're still very heavily, you know, uh, resentful towards a lot of the actions of the, of the British Army there. Um, the <coughs> person, one of the people I spoke to in reference to this recent report, specifically spoke about what, what he described as indiscriminate uh, targeting of civilians in uh, Basra as early as, you know, even during the kind of period... Um, when the uh, initial invasion was still ongoing uh, rather than the occupation period and onwards. And others have spoken about, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to teenagers, uh, children being targeted for seemingly, you know, for no, for no reason, not holding any weapons. Um, so, so, you know, they're very willing to, um, to back up these reports. Um, and, of course, there are other issues. One, one of their issues, of course, is, is the lack of accountability that's been since then and the inability of a lot of them to actually um, find out uh, detailed information about what, you know, what the circumstances of, of, of loved ones who have been killed or, or disappeared. 
Yeah, you spoke to a gentleman called Salim who still lives in Basra, and this is a direct quote from Salim from your article. I was one of the people who were targeted while I was walking uh, on Al Zubair Bridge, uh, that area in Basra. They targeted, they being the British soldiers, targeted passers by with bullets. There were a lot of civilians in the area. Uh, this was in April 2003, as you say, just pretty much at the start of the British uh, involvement there. The British were killing anyone, he says, who was just walking around. Uh, Charles, and then Muntaza Al-Zaidi, who's that journalist who in 2008 threw a shoe at President George W. Bush, he says, again in Alex's article, this is cheap and low and reminds us of the mentality and ethics of the medieval ages. The British Army is militarily modern, but it is humanely and morally backward. The effect of the British Army's occupation and these sort of tactics being employed, this kind of advice being given to soldiers to allow them to target these sorts of innocent civilians. What has that done to the British and what did it do to the British forces while they were there trying to uh, carry out their orders? Well, of course, this has not just on the impact, let's shall we say, psychologically on British soldiers in terms of uh, the effects of them after the war. And many of those have spoken about that, including in the article. <clears throat> of course, there are huge reputational issues as well. The British Army likes to pride itself on being highly professional, and I think generally it is. Um, I, I can't speak uh, for those specific incidents you mentioned because obviously I wasn't there, none of us was there. Um, but they deserve, uh, all of them deserve proper uh, independent and thorough investigation. And uh, the problem is that to a large degree that hasn't happened so far. You've had situations where it's the British military police that have in largely been responsible for investigating these matters. Um, then when um, uh, the historic uh, uh, in, in, uh, inquiries team has taken over, which has involved civilian police, you've then had, uh, it must be said, and this has been found even by the regulatory bodies, uh, those that govern solicitors and lawyers in the UK, you've had situations where people have come forward with claims uh, that they were abused, mistreated by British soldiers, um, and uh, in, in largely it would appear in terms of seeking compensation from the British Army and the British government. And then very spectacularly, unfortunately, those claims have been shown to be woefully false. And indeed, there's been disciplinary action even against British lawyers as a result of pursuing those cases. And the effect of that is really to discredit um, generally the whole idea that the British Army acted unlawfully in this way. I've no doubt, and I think most former British soldiers uh, will have no doubt that some, in some instances, the British troops, as American troops, and indeed troops of almost all countries, under battle situations, and even in some cases, we know of many cases, in fact, in Iraq and Afghanistan, where even not in battle situations, so they haven't got that excuse of the panic and the last minute thinking, have gone well beyond what their legal rights were to actually commit human rights abuses, including murder. And the problem is now that because this has been overstated in some ways over the last couple of years in some instances, there is now very little political appetite, I think, in the United Kingdom uh, certainly not amongst the media, to pursue these kind of allegations. Um, and it might be that some time has to pass before this legacy of uh, these mass claims being made, which have been proven in court to be false, um, to pass so that then investigations can continue. And there will be hope for the future. Let's face it, at the moment, people are being prosecuted or at least investigated, even for offences that were committed 30 to 40 years ago in the British Army, for example, in Northern Ireland. And so it may be that just because nothing's happened so far that it won't happen in the future. The pressure needs to be kept up and with proper sound investigations such as the article we're talking about. Charles, as a former British Army officer, how clear are the rules of engagement with civilians, <coughs> unarmed people who are not wearing military uniforms? Well, they are quite clear. And the problem here isn't that the rules of engagement were wrong necessarily. It's that the rules of engagement were informally, that's to say, just by the word of senior officers, according to the report, uh, relaxed in a way that doesn't seem to have been uh, sanctioned, uh, 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 shall we say, in writing at least, so that it would appear that nobody's held accountable for them. So, for example, if we look at the rules of engagement, it doesn't say that you can only engage people who are in uniform. It doesn't even say that you can only engage people who are carrying a weapon. So you could be unarmed yourself, but you can be on a mobile phone or a radio or with a pair of binoculars, and you can be calling down artillery, mortar, or rocket fire. The um, uh, laws of war, the, uh, the international humanitarian law, for example, um, takes account of that. For example, the ICRC, the Red Cross, uh, which largely manages or oversees uh, the laws of war, uh, at least to a large degree, they even make clear that uh, a, a non-combatant will lose their non-combatant status the moment they participate 
in hostilities. That doesn't need to say less to with a weapon themselves. So there can be a case, of course, where people can be lawfully engaged, even though they're unarmed, even though they're not in a uniform. Uh, for example, the uniform aspect, any terrorist isn't going to wear a uniform usually, for example. Um, the problem comes when those rules were relaxed, according to the report and according to the witnesses in the report, um, who state that they were then told by senior officers, actually now you don't have to have suspicion that they're taking part in hostilities. You can engage anybody with a mobile phone, anybody with a shovel. And it's quite obviously conceivable that in a very great number of examples, probably the majority of examples, people carrying mobile phones, people carrying shovels uh, in a Middle Eastern country or indeed any country are not overwhelmingly, in the majority of cases, going to be people worthy of engagement. And then as soon as you, uh, shall we say, uh, loosen those rules of engagement in that way, you undermine them and you give carte blanche to possibly a small minority of people who then will um, either uh, not have proper fire discipline in a battle situation or simply, as in all professions, perhaps more the army more than most, attracts its fair share of psychopaths and people who want to exercise power over those that don't have it, including killing, maiming, and otherwise abusing them. And sure. as I say, what this is it really counts to is an absolute failure of management and leadership on the part of the officers and the senior, uh, the non-commissioned officers who were managing those soldiers. Okay, Alex, uh, let me on uh, your behalf, on behalf mm -hmm. of the Middle East Eye, and also on our behalf here on TRT World, say that we've both approached the Ministry of Defence in London and we haven't received any reply. So just confirm for me, Alex, if you have. Uh, still not received a reply because we haven't, uh, really leading into the issue of whether there's a government cover-up going on here. Okay, in the report introducing this discussion, that Iraq Historic Allegations team that was set up in 2010 by the Labour government, when that was closed, overnight its outstanding cases went from 34,400, 34,400 outstanding cases to suddenly overnight 20 that suggests at least some sort of cover-up or sweeping something under the carpet. Alex? Uh, yeah, well, uh, as you said, no, we haven't had any response from the Ministry of Defence yet. Um, in, in terms of a cover-up, I mean, I think this is a mixture of things. I mean, it's a mixture of, uh, as Charles was saying, a, a very kind of politicised atmosphere in which any kind of uh, attempt to be seen to uh, uh, investigate uh, the armed forces has very, you know, you get very little political capital out of that. It's very much seen as a kind of a... Uh, an anti-nationalist sort of uh, unpatriotic um, sort of act. And there's also a mixture of um, an element of just an inability now this time after the war, considering it was a war setting and it was uh, a rather chaotic one to actually maintain the kind of evidence needed. But I, I mean, th th there's also a degree of incompetence involved in terms of actually trying to take these issues to, to court. I mean, I, I know someone in Basra, for example, a guy called Salam al-Maliki, whose son was uh, basically uh, abducted or taken by British uh, soldiers um, during the occupation and disappeared. And to this day, he's not been able to get any information from uh, the Ministry, the Ministry of Defence or Home Office or anyone um, or Foreign Office uh, about, uh, about his, his whereabouts. And plenty of other historic allegations like that are still, you know, they're, they're, still, they're still floating around out there. So, I mean, in terms of a cover-up. I mean, I would just say it's a mixture of, of incompetence and a lack of political will, if anything. <clears throat> Senior British politicians uh, from the governing party in the UK at the moment have criticised those who have been pursuing these sorts of allegations we're talking about. They've been called unscrupulous. They've, uh, their actions are said uh, have been described as being enemies of justice. Theresa May, the current Prime Minister, has criticised activist left-wing human rights lawyers. Let's leave the politics aside. Charles, a final question to you. You've been in combat situations. In terms of what's alleged to have happened in Iraq, in 2003, it's still one of the most enduring controversies of the British presence in the country. Six British soldiers in a police station not far from Basra were killed by insurgents. How much might something like that condition a soldier who's coming later into the country in terms of their fear and their understanding of the environment into which they're arriving, which might make it easier for them to carry this sort of alleged advice to kill innocent people. Soldiers are human at the end of the day. Um, I've seen it even in, for example, Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom itself, where uh, if uh, we went into uh, patrolling, for example, in an area where uh, people had carried out abuses, soldiers of the civilian population in the past, that's to say just beating them up, 
stealing their possessions and so on. Um, it made the whole population, of course, uh, turn up against uh, the soldiers. And then, um, for example, uh, vice versa was also the case. If a bomb went off, you saw a situation where, um, of course, one or two soldiers would be killed, uh, more likely many uh, badly injured. And, of course, uh, a lot of soldiers, being human, would then naturally want to take it out on the entire population. And I'm sure that was happening in uh, Afghanistan and um, in Iraq as well. The problem is this is where it comes down to leadership. Management uh, officers are paid uh, and trained to manage properly. And when they turn a blind eye or even worse, encourage or give license to the excesses of their soldiers, these kind of incidents happen where abuses take place. And of course, in the long run, it's counterproductive. It, it defeats the mission's aim and indeed um, turns the population generally against the soldiers who are either liberating or occupying them, depending on your perspective. And so it's in, probably in everybody's interest that the genuine cases here of abuse, and undoubtedly there will be many of those, are in time properly investigated and those that carried them out held to account, not least to prevent these things happening in the future. Charles, Alex, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the Newsmakers. We appreciate it.